Hey guys, okay, let's um, talk about the second half of chapter four. So let's start with quadratic functions. Remember last time we were talking about linear models. So now we're gonna talk about a little bit more complicated functions. Um, so these are quadratic functions. So when linear functions are too simple to represent reality, we might want to use something more complicated. So quadratic functions might involve some maximum or minimum point reach, and they can be graphically represented using parabolas. Right? Um, they're generally written in the following form. So f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Right? So this is our linear form if we just use this, and our quadratic term is that x squared term. OK, so these are some um, graphs of these quadratic functions, or what we call parabolas, right? So there's parabolic shapes here. So the dashed line on each of these graphs is what we call the axis of symmetry. So that's where the parabolas are symmetric about, right? About this line here, these dotted lines. And so the minimum uh, the maximum point here, the minimum point here, and the minimum point here. Those are what we call the vertex of the parabola. Okay. And um, we can also use completing the squares method of solving equations um, to find these vertex values. Right. Uh, so in figure one here, this is figures 4.6.1. Um, 4.6.2 and 4.6.3 in your book. So the first one here is when a, right, a, this a value here is less than zero, right? So when a is less than zero, your parabola generally opens downward. And then your b squared is greater than your 4ac, right? So if we use that, um, our quadratic equation, right? So Remember, it's minus b plus or minus the square root of um, b squared minus 4ac, right, all over 2a. So we know that the term underneath that square root is b squared minus 4ac. So when b squared is greater than 4ac, this is the type of curve that we get. And so when a squared, when this a value, when a here is positive, we have an, op on an upward facing parabola. Right, and this is when b squared is less than your 4ac. Right, so you get this general shape. And then when you have a positive value for a, but your b squared is equal to your 4ac, this is what you get. Right, so um, below here. So when we look at the completing the squares method, um, you can find the derivation of um, how we get this in the book. So we know that when a is positive, right, we have um, a parabola that faces upwards. So that means that we have some minimum point. Our vertex is a minimum, right? So if a is positive, then the function has a minimum where x is equal to minus b over 2a. On the other hand, if a is less than zero, a is negative, we know that the parabola opens downward, right? So we have some maximum value at our vertex. Then our function has a maximum at x is equal to negative b divided by 2a. Okay, so this becomes very um, important when we look at optimization. Um, so we want to find, so doing optimization, we often want to find these maximum and minimum points. So that's why it's important to know how to get these um, maximum and minimum values. Okay, so let's look at an example from our book, which is example 4.6.1. So suppose you have a price of P per unit um, obtained by a firm in producing and selling these so Q units. Um, and the price is equal to this equation. So the price is equal to 102 minus 2 times Q, right? And the cost of producing and selling these Q units, so we have a cost function here, right? And our cost function is quadratic because we have the square term. Then we know that the profit function, which is 
um, denoted by this, you know, this pi symbol, right? So that's just the price times the quantity minus the cost, right? So we'll just plug in, right? So this is the price, right? Price times quantity minus the cost function. And then we simplify that and we get this 100q minus 5 over 2q squared. And then what we want to do is we want to find the value of q which maximizes profits and the corresponding maximal profit. So we're going to use formula 4. So formula 4 is uh, referring to this one. And we find that the profit is maximized at Q, which is equal to Q star, which is equal to negative 100. So 100 is our B, so minus B over 2 times our A, which is negative 5 half. So this is B and this is A. So we just plug that into our formula and we get a quantity of 20. So Q, the quantity at 20, is the one that maximizes profits with, and then we want to find the corresponding maximal profit. So all we do is we take our profit function and we plug in this maximal value of Q. Right? So Q is 20, right? So we just plug that in and then we get that the profit at that optimal quantity of Q star, which is 20, will give us a profit of 1,000. So obviously this is a special case of the monopoly problem. Um, and then you can look at the monopoly problem in the book. Okay, let's move on. So the next section is on polynomials. So these are even more complicated models than quadratic equations. So we look at we first look at what we call cubic functions. So following quadratic functions where we have this um, x squared term, that is here. So this should be x squared here. Um, right? So we look at the cubic term. So x raised to the, the third power. Right? So that gives us a cubic term. So these two graphs are visual or graphical depictions of cubic functions. So the point at which the slope turns from, say, negative um, to positive, or to zero, is where we have a point in between there that we call the inflection point. Um, so we know that in cubic functions, there's always this inflection point, right? So we have this kind of curvature, and the slope will always go from negative to positive or positive to negative at some point which is a special thing with um, cubic functions. So in general, um, let's look at a polynomial. So these can be linear, quadratic, cubic, and so on and so forth. Right? So the function p defined for all x can be represented by this polynomial of x, um, where you have some coefficients so these are a subscript n and minus one um, so it's a general polynomial of degree n right so we have polynomial n polynomial n minus one all the way down to um, just you know x to the one and then our constant here, right? so we can look at the example one N, so we have a general polynomial of degree 4, right? So n is equal to 4. So we'll just plug that in. So we have some coefficient a to 4, uh, sub to 4, right, which is the coefficient on our um, fourth degree polynomial, right? And then we plug in a, whatever the coefficient is on the cubic term, whatever the coefficient is on the squared term, and whatever the coefficient is on just our linear term, and then we have another constant uh, coefficient, right? So in this section, uh, it does go over how to factor polynomials, right? So factoring general poly polynomials and how to do polynomial division. Um, so those are things that you can review on your own, and 
oh, polynomial division with a remainder. So please review those on your own and make sure that you understand them. I'm not going to heavily test um, you on them, but I do expect you to know how to do them. So if you have any questions or you want me to clarify, please let me know. Um, but let's go on and talk about rational functions. Um, so, rational functions can be expressed as a ratio of two polynomials. Okay, so let's look at the example that's in your book, which is example 4.7.7. So, one of the simplest types of rational function is just ax plus b divided by cx plus d. Okay, so the graph of this rational function is what we call a hyperbola. So the graph of a typical hyperbola, I'll just graph it really quickly. So this is your x, and this is your y-axis, and a hyperbola looks something like this. So it never quite touches the y-axis, but it does come close to it. So it's just these two lines here. All right, so we can look at a simple simple case where rx is equal to a divided by x, where a is not, uh, where a is greater than zero. Okay, so we can look at you know, figure five shows us what this graph looks like when we look at it in the first quadrant. And the interesting to th um, interesting thing to note here is that the shaded area a is always equal to little a. So if we know that this shaded rectangular area is, um, so that's length times width for a rectangle, right? So x naught times a divided by x naught, that area is always equal to a. Right? So big A, this, um, this area, regardless of where you choose the point p on this curve, is, also, is always equal to little a. So that's an interesting thing about this graph. Okay. So now we want to look at power functions. So this is the general case of a power function. So a function of x is equal to some big A, where big A is any constant times x raised to some power of r, where r is any constant. So this is our power function, right, when x is raised to any power. And these are some um, samples of graphs, right? So we know that when r is between 0 and 1, right, we have that, um, that rooted function. Right? And then we know that a root must always be positive, so we have this graph here. Right? Take um, x to the 1 half as an example. Right? We know that the square root function looks very similar to this. And so what happens when our power or our r is greater than 1? Well, then the curve slopes upward like this. Right? So you can think of this as maybe half of the parabola. And then when r is negative, right? so when r is less than 0, we get this function. So it never completely touches the x or y axis. It just approaches it. So sort of like that last example where we graph the hyperbola in the first quadrant. And then here's a graph of what it looks like when we change the powers, right? So we go from 3 to 1 to 1 half to 1 third. Right? So you can see how the graphs change as the power um, changes on the x value. It's important to note this because we're going to see this a lot, these types of power functions. Um, so I know that the book goes a little more in depth. Um, you can look at some more examples in the book, but uh, that's about as far as I'm going to go. We're going to talk about exponential functions now. So exponential functions are quantities that increase by a fixed factor per unit of time. Um, when they increase ex um, exponentially or they decrease exponentially. Um, so here in our example, if the fixed factor is a, this leads to the exponential function. So we also have exponential functions in this case. Right? So we have some function of t, which is generally time, which is equal to um, a positive constant a and that little fixed factor a raised to the power of t. 
Yeah, here's what a general exponential function looks like when our base, that little a, is greater than zero. Um, so a is the factor by which f of x changes when x increases by one unit. Okay, so if we have that a is equal to one over um, one plus p divided by a hundred, and p is positive, and of course this big A is positive, then we have that f of x will increase by this p of x, um, p percent, for each unit increase in x, right? So we're looking at an exponentially increasing function. And on the other hand, if A, which is equal to 1 minus p over 100, where p is some value between 0 and 100, and A is also positive again, then f of x will be an exponentially decreasing function. And f of x will decrease by p percent for each unit increase in x. Okay, so let's take a look at these graphs. Um, so another thing that um, we want to talk about is what this e is, right? So this function of f of x, which equals to e of x, is what we call the natural exponential function. Um, e, the letter e, which generally um, represents an irrational number, right? So e, if you just type this on your calculator, you get 2.71188. Um, and so on and so forth, right? And so if we graph what this function looks like, right, so we can have um, an exponentially increasing function. So that is when our exponent on the, uh, the natural exponent e is positive, so it'll be increasing. And on the other hand, if it's negative, then we have that it's decreasing. And you can see that these two graphs are symmetric about the y-axis. But this is um, this is a good function to know and to memorize the graph of. This is something that you will see often in economics. The next section, or the last section of this chapter is on logarithmic functions. So basically in the last section, right, we saw that what happens when the function changes, right, exponentially, right, um, with time, right? So how how the quantity increases um, per unit of time, right? So um, given this equation, what happens when we want to solve for the t, right? How do we undo these um, exponential functions? Well, the answer to that is that we use logarithmic functions. So if we look first at the um, natural exponential function e. How do we undo that? Well, the the way that we do that is we use the natural logarithm. So for any positive value a, basically, if we have e raised to the power of the natural log, which is that ln of a, we get basically a. So if so, if we take the natural log of e, um, then we get a. So let's look at some rules, right? These are the rules that are given in your book. Basically, the first is just saying that the natural log of the parentheses x times y can be rewritten as the natural log of x plus the natural log of y. So the logarithm of a product is the sum of the logarithms of the factors. And similar, similarly, the log, the natural log of x divided by y can just be written as the difference, right? So multiplication just leads to summation, and the quotient leads to the difference. Right? And then here we have this um, rule where it says that um, the natural log of x raised to some power p, right? We just take this exponent and we'll put it in front of the natural log. And then we have some other proper, uh, some other rules for logarithms. The logarithm, the natural log of one is just equal to zero. 
um, the natural log of e, right, is just equal to 1. Yeah. So it's basically undoing the e, the natural log of the natural exponent. And so um, x is just equal to e raised to the power of ln, uh, the natural log of x, right? So that's similar to here when x is positive. And the natural log of e to the x is just simply x. So these are good rules to memorize for natural logs. Natural logs are very commonly seen in economic applications. Right? And please know that there are no simple formulas for things like the natural log of x plus y and the natural log of x minus y. So there are a few examples in your book. Um, on how to simplify these and using these rules, um, please review them on your own. Also know, go over the examples um, where you solve for x. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. So let's go on. So basically, for each positive number of x, the number um, of the natural log of x is defined by e to the natural log of x, which is just equal to x. So basically, in other words, if u is equal to the natural log of x, um, this is the solution to the equation e to the u, right? So basically, um, we call that resulting function um, g of x, which equals to the natural log of x. So basically, um, the second figure is a, um, a graph of the actual um, ln of x function, right? So this is what we, this is what the ln of x function looks like. And so what happens when we have logarithms with bases other than e, right? So that's, so instead of e, it's a, so our, our natural base, or our base here is a. So basically it's saying a raised to the power of the log, where our base um, is a of x, is just equal to x. Right? So that works similarly to our natural log. So please go over some examples of these. Um, and you can also apply the same rules that we saw before to um, logarithms with bases other than e. Please let me know if you have any questions, you need some clarification on this chapter. Basically, I just want you to recognize these types of functions because these are functions that you will be seeing quite a bit in economics. So you should be really familiar with them and know um, how to do their operations and the rules to follow. All right, that's it for this chapter.